Well, now we have our next speaker, our next uh, special guest speaker for the night. Professor Madeleine van Oppen, she's a, an ecological gen geneticist from the Netherlands who loves algae and coral reefs and the combination of the two means she's uh, trying to find a biological solution through bioengineering to help save our precious coral reefs, those uh, ancient beautiful structures from the impacts of climate change. Now, how would that work? Let's find out. Joining us from the University of Melbourne and from the Australian Institute of Marine Science uh, to present on designer corals and the future of coral reefs, please welcome to the stage, Dr. Madeleine Van Oppen. Thanks, thank you, Natasha. Thank you. So yeah, we just heard from Mike um, about a number of Australia's fossil icons, but I'll be talking about one of the biggest Australia's living fossils, the Great Barrier Reef. So coral reefs indeed are living biological structures. Some are so large that we can see them from space, such as the Great Barrier Reef. But the animals that actually build the corals are relatively small. Um, this coral is a yeah, typical branching coral, and it's only about 30 centimeters in diameter. So corals are animals that are related to sea anemones and um, jellyfish. So if we have a closer look at the branch of the corals, we can see that it's made up of identical units, the coral polyps. And each of those lives sort of protected within a calcium carbonate cup. It's the exoskeleton that the coral builds itself to protect itself. If we look even, even closer, and here we see a close-up of a coral polyp with the tentacles extended. We can see that it has a golden brown color. And this color is due to the microalgae that live inside the coral tissues. These microalgae can capture the energy of the sun and they can use that to make sugars and other nutritious, nutritious compounds from carbon dioxide and water. And the great thing is that the algae actually pass on most of that um, nutrition to the coral host animal. And that means that the coral depends on these algae for its survival. Now, um, um, the increasing emissions of uh, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases by humans since the um, Industrial Revolution has caused uh, rapid climate warming. And this is a problem for corals. Because the algal coral symbiosis is very sensitive to temperature increases. So if the uh, heat goes up, um, the corals will lose the algae and um, the tissues will then um, turn transparent and we can see the white coral skeleton through the translucent tissues and this is called coral bleaching. And during extreme uh, hot, hot conditions like during summer heat waves, whole reefs can become bleached. And if the coral is not, is not able to re-establish that symbiosis, it will starve because it depends on, on the energy from the sun that the algae sort of fixes for it, and it will eventually die. So let's have a closer look at what happens inside the coral tissue during these heat stress events and what actually triggers bleaching. So here again, we see a close-up of a coral polyp with the tentacles and the mouth. And if we zoom in, we can see that the tissues of the coral are very simple. They consist of two cell layers, one protecting the coral from the outside world, the epidermis, and another one lining the coral gut, the gastrodermis. Now, these algal symbionts live inside the gastrodermal cell of the coral. Um, they have these large yellow structures called chloroplasts, and that is where the sunlight is captured and where the, the energy of the sun is used to um, fix carbon. If we um, go zoom in even further into the chloroplast, we can see that it consists of a number of membranes, and they are called the thylakoids. And on these membranes, there are a number of proteins that are actually embedded in these membranes. And those are the structures that can capture the photons from the light and turn that photo energy into chemical energy. However, when the heat goes up, those proteins become damaged, and they can no longer process that photo energy um, properly. And, and that leads then um, um, to a lot of, uh, in, instead of making sugars, what happens next is that um, that energy is uh, used to make toxic molecules. And we call them reactive oxygen molecules or reactive oxygen species. And these molecules leak into the coral host cells and they cause oxidative stress. They're toxic to the cell. And this results in the coral spitting out the algal symbionts. <laughs> 
as you can see happening here. And that can happen throughout um, the whole branch of a coral. We can see here how the algae are being lost and the coral is turning white. And if the heat stress persists, that will happen across the whole coral colony. And that is the process that we call coral bleaching. We'll see that here in a second. Here we see how the coral begins to pale. Now, sometimes these bleaching events are fairly isolated, but other times um, they can occur across all of the tropics, and we call those global mass bleaching events. And um, since um, we started recording these uh, bleaching events, there have been three uh, global mass bleaching events, and the last one, uh, which occurred between 2014 and 2017, was the most severe one. Um, more than 70% of the reefs in the world bleached during that period and suffered from severe mortality due to bleaching. On our own Great Barrier Reef, we had two back-to-back -back mass bleaching events in 2016 and 2017. And over the course of those two years, we lost almost half of the corals present. Half of the corals on the Great Barrier Reef died due to the summer heat waves in 2016 and 2017. So that is pretty serious. Um, so, ultimately, the only way to save coral reefs, reefs is to reduce greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to stop further warming. But we're not doing a great job at that. In fact, um, carbon dioxide levels are still increasing in the atmosphere. And that means that, in the interim, we need additional solutions to, to buy time until the world deals with climate warming. And there are two solutions that are being explored. The first one is to reduce bleach, bleaching stress, and that can um, include um, the reduction of uh, light that reaches the coral, because um, bleaching is triggered both by um, temperature to the photosystem during heat, by heat, as you saw, and also by the light energy that actually reaches the coral. So if we can reduce that light energy, uh, we see less bleaching. So some scientists are developing sort of floating sun shields or trying to increase cloud formation to reduce the amount of light that hits the coral during a summer heat wave. Other researchers are trying to um, um, uh, develop uh, big fans that pump cooler water from the deeper uh, zones of the reefs to cool the reef, the reef area where the corals actually grow. And secondly, we can use bioengineering method to try and increase the heat tolerance of the corals themselves. And that is the, the focus of my research. We are um, exploring three main um, bioengineering approaches. The first one is managed or selective breeding. So here we use certain criteria to select coral broodstock from the field. And then we cross these corals in the lab to create offspring that is more tolerant to heat. I will talk a little bit more about this in a minute. The second approach is to um, expose corals to fairly mild stress to try and evoke um, a, a response that, make that makes that coral and its offspring more tolerant to subsequent heat stress events. And the third one is um, the manipulation of the microbiome of corals. So, uh, here we're not only talking about the microalgal symbionts, but also of, uh, about bacteria. Um, analogous, analogous to our own bacterial gut microbiome, corals um, associated with a wide diversity of bacteria that are critical to their health and functioning. And so we can try and manipulate those microbes to help the corals cope better with uh, climate warming. So we, what we are doing at the moment, we are sort of testing these sort of bioengineering approaches in the lab. And eventually, we, we will select the manipulations that work, that give us some sort of benefits, and, and, and sort of go further with those. And that involves um, assessing the feasibilities of these interventions. It needs to be affordable. It needs to be doable at scale. Um, the, the ecological risks need to be you know, acceptable. Uh, and, of course, we need to initiate, initiate discussions with stakeholders, with um, the users of the reef, the regulators, traditional owners, and so on. And the next step, then, is to conduct controlled field trials, and eventually we hope to implement some of these, of these um, bioengineering methods and, and try and save the reef. Um, so in the next four or so slides, I'll just give you a little bit more information of some of the things that we have tried and some of the successes that we've made. So one of the uh, managed breeding approaches is um, hybridization. 
Along the Great Barrier Reef, there's a natural temperature gradient where it's warmer in the north and cooler in the south. And over evolutionary time, the corals in the north have adapted to these locally warmer conditions. So they are more tolerant to heat than those in the south. So we can take those corals out of, the, uh, out of the field and in the lab cross them. So we're trying to breed the heat tolerance alleles from the north into offspring um, in the south and then um, basically place those hybrids that have increased thermal tolerance um, at those cooler reefs to prepare those for further warming. And indeed we found in the lab that that is the case. If at least one of the parents comes from a warmer reef, the offspring will be more tolerant to heat than offspring from uh, too cold parents. We can also breed between different species. And here we don't um, select the parents for their um, relative heat tolerance. But the motivation is that if you bring together two divergent genomes from different species into the one hybrid organism, you create new gene combinations. And some of these new gene combinations may have benefits in terms of the coral's tolerance to, to increased uh, temperature. And um, again, we tested in, this in the lab, and, and we found that some of the hybrids indeed have increased climate resilience. So we are super excited about this finding, and we're now at a stage where we just began testing the performance of these hybrids in the field. So earlier this year, we've placed them out, and um, well, wait and see what happens. So we're very excited about that. Then um, one of the other approaches I spoke about was the microbiome manipulation. And so corals um, have very diverse bacterial microbiomes, tens if not hundreds of different of species, bacterial species associated with a single coral animal. And um, when I uh, showed you the video, I showed that it was those toxic molecules produced by the algal symbionts, the ROS, that, that trigger the coral bleaching. So if we perhaps can um, uh, manipulate uh, the microbiome to be more able to scavenge, to neutralize these toxic molecules, perhaps that can prevent bleaching in corals. And this hypothesis is supported by a really neat experiment that some scientists have done where they basically bathed corals in an exogenous antioxidant and showed that if you heat them up, it actually prevents bleaching. Now, luckily, we can culture most of the bacteria that associate with the coral, and that allows us then to test which of these species have a high ability to scavenge those toxic molecules. And our hypothesis is then that if we um, inoculate coral larvae or adult corals with a probiotic that has a high ability to neutralize these toxic molecules, we may be able to prevent bleaching. And then finally, um, um, very briefly, we can also manipulate the algal symbionts themselves, the ones that actually are the, the problem and, and trigger bleaching. Um, we can isolate those algae from the coral, and many of them can be cultured in the laboratory. And the great thing about that is that in the lab, we can speed up the rate of evolution of these algae. And so we evolved these algae under increasing uh, temperatures, so to make them more tolerant to heat. And this process takes about two to four years. So it's fast in terms of um, evolution in the field, but it still takes quite a long time. We then um, test whether those algae are indeed more tolerant to heat, and we found that almost all of the lab-evolved lab algae do increase their um, temperature tolerance, and they also reduce the amount of those reactive oxygen species that they, that they produce. So that, that's great. But perhaps more important is, can they still form a symbiosis with coral? And we found indeed they can. But do they also increase the bleaching toler tolerance of the coral? And here we found that only about a third of the lab-evolved algae also increase the thermal tolerance, the bleaching tolerance of the coral. And we found that it's those algae that have evolved um, specific adaptation in addition to the ROS scavenging um, um, ability that are able to increase the coral heat tolerance. So I'd like to end with um, just two slides sharing some of my thoughts as to how we might be able to implement some of these interventions maybe in, in the near future. And again, I envisage that um, we have very large aquaculture facility where, facilities where we can rear millions and millions of coral larvae. And they could be hybrid larvae and we could perhaps condition them. And we can then um, supplement uh, or provide these larvae with the right cocktail of bacteria 
and also with the right algal symbionts that give them the best chances to survive um, in the field and to withstand summer heat waves. Then, of course, we have to be clever and think about how are we go actually going to get that coral material out into the field. And um, other coral reef scientists are trying to develop the best methods to do this. Um, some of my colleagues are playing around with this, where they put a large mesh over the reef and, and pump larvae underneath the mesh and leave the, the mesh there for a few days, and it forces the larvae to settle on that reef patch. And it really increases um, uh, set settlement recruitment rates. There is now also a robot that can, that can deliver la coral larvae to the reef, so that's quite exciting. And others are exploring whether perhaps we should settle these larvae in the lab, and they are exploring what sort of structure would work best, uh, which structures um, makes the coral um, grow better, survive better, or are easy to get them out into the field. And you have to keep in mind, all of these interventions need to be cost-effective, otherwise it will never happen. But if we could achieve um, um, a desired um, impact um, only by engineered microbes, that might be even simpler. We may just be able to spray those microbes onto the reef. Or I can imagine that we develop a robot um, that we can train using machine learning methods to recognize bleached coral. And perhaps if we deliver a probiotic, it may help the coral to recover fast from bleaching. Who knows? So I'm going to leave it at that. I just wanted to put up a slide with most of my current um, collaborators and lab members who are instrumental in driving this research. research. And, and thank you, and I'm happy to take questions if there's time. <laughs> Madeline Van Oppen, thank you so much. I'd love your questions. Just pop your hand up. I'm going to kick off with a question, Madeline. <laughs> it's a very interesting point that we've got to, isn't it? That we're contemplating fixing reefs using engineering techniques, bioengineering techniques. Yeah, 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 we have to clean up the mess that we made. <laughs> well, it's the technology yeah. and our lifestyle that stuffed it up for the corals in the first place. So yeah. it, does this, this whole effort give you kind of hope for technological tools or does it, does it come from a place of despair as well for you? A little bit of both. It does give me hope, but I don't think just bioengineering will save corals because I think we can push the, uh, the limits a little bit with those technologies, but I don't think we can continue to heat up the earth and corals will uh, survive simply by engineering them. I think it will give, give us a little bit of extra time, but it's not going to solve the problem. Mm. Why do you want to save the reef? And why do you want to save coral reefs around the world? Why, why are corals important? to you, <laughs> as a scientist who's dedicated her life to their cause. They're amazing, they're amazing biological structures. I mean, they're highly biodiverse, they're beautiful, they have value to me personally, but they have other values to others. You know, the traditional owners, they have cultural values to them, they have economic values. Um, so, yeah, there are many, many reasons why we would want to save coral reefs. Uh, I think we have a responsibility to save biodiversity. I think it's very arrogant of humans to just destroy everything around them and think that that's okay. So I think um, as a scientist, I feel we have a duty to do whatever we can to contribute to saving life on Earth. Any questions? Excellent. I wonder whether we're going to bioengineer ourselves to be more resilient and adaptive <laughs> to climate change too. We live in interesting times. Um, hi. I'm just wondering whether you've... There, Obviously, many different species of the corals yep. on mm -hmm. the reef, um, whether some of them react differently to others, obviously. And the other question was whether there are many different species of algae that are living symbio in the symbiotic relationship and whether that, uh, that combination can be changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, definitely. Um, there are many coral, uh, species of coral, and I don't think we will be able to engineer every single one of them. There's all, there are also many species of algae, um, some uh, associate with a wider diversity of coral, which is great, because if we can engineer those, we might be able to help uh, a broader diversity of coral species. Um, but some of those symbioses are very specific. Um, so there might be some algal species that tend to associate with maybe only a single species of coral and, and vice versa. So um, does that answer your question? So yeah, there's, there's some challenges there, but um, we, we don't think that we will be able to uh, um, save all of the bio coral biodiversity. Um, so we're really thinking about how much 
yeah, functional diversity, we call it, do you need to have to have a functional coral reef? And so that is um, diversity in the morphologies of the coral colony. Some are plates, some are branching, some are massive, and that has major impacts on other coral reef life that associates with them. So if we can capture that diversity, that's a good start. Some are fast growing, um, contribute to the fast, you know, um, cycle of life and other slower growing. So we need to capture that diversity, but we we'll definitely won't be able to do this for all species. Got another question. Thanks. So I know that there's the on sort of like there's lots of levels in the water where there's different coral reefs and there's some really deep water coral reef ecosystems. So what about them and like, do they have their own issues that are being explored? Like yeah, that's a really good question. So there definitely are corals in deeper water, not so much coral reefs, so they, there's not as many that they form a reef. Um, generally, the deeper water corals are different, different species to the ones in the shallow, but there are some corals that occur from the shallow all the way to the deep, the same species. And people have been wondering, oh, maybe those deep water corals can actually eventually uh, come back to the shallow and help restore the damaged reef in, in the shallow. But we actually find that even if they are the same species, they are actually biologically quite different, and often they can actually, can actually not survive very well in the shallow. So yet, yeah, so the, the deeper water ecosystems are quite distinct from, from the shallow waters. They have also have issues, but they're, but they're different to the, to the sort of typically shallow water coral reefs. Another question over here, thanks. Uh, yeah, hi, just um, sort of on a bit what the young fellow was saying as well, when you were talking about the more heat tolerant one crossing with the cooler ones, yeah. mm -hmm. it basically looked like you pretty much the north of the reef will be just dead. Like, from, like are you just giving up on that part of the reef and trying to oh, say whether we can push that even further, you mean? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, also a very good question. Yes, you get, to, you get to a level where there's nothing that's warmer. People talk about should we bring corals from the Middle East where summer temperatures typically are 35, 36 degrees centigrade and you know, eventually might we be able to use that stock to restore the Northern Great Barrier Reef. We're not going there yet because there's all sort of other issues um, with that, but maybe depending on how desperate we are. People are also looking at different habitats and find, for instance, in the, in the Northern Great Barrier Reef, mangrove systems are very hot and have a lot of variation in temperature and also in other environmental facts. And we find that the corals that live there are extremely tolerant to heat. So some of my colleagues are using that stock to see if they can not sort of move it latitudinally, but cross shelf, whether we can use that to increase thermal tolerance on the reef. So, yeah. Thank you for the fantastic questions. And I, I just want to ask, did, if you were able to bioengineer entire landscapes of reefs, <laughs> do we, would we think of them as nature's formations anymore? Or are we going to think of them as human constructions or human-aided constructions? I think they can be human constructions, but we need to... You know, on, on land, we seem to be totally comfortable with that, right? We live in such a manicured env environment, mostly in our cities. Even a lot of the forests are, are sort of have been changed by, by human influences, and we seem to be accepting of that. But when it comes to the marine environment, everybody resists that um, human interference, and I think is it's better to have a human constructed coral reef than no coral reef at all. I'm going to take a vote on that. Is it better to have a human constructed or assisted reef than no reef at all? Is it a yes? <laughs> Put your hands up. Yay! <laughs> Is it a no? <laughs> interesting. Person. That's yeah. so interesting. Yeah. Um, let's thank Madeleine Van Oppen for being here from the University of Melbourne and Ames, the Australian Institute much. of Marine Science. Thank you so much.